um, we were fortunate that Carolyn has an, is an officer of the Association of Adventist Women. And so she goes to those meetings. And she, the last meeting she went to was a meeting. It was near Oakwood College. It was, was it on the campus? It was right on the campus. And there she heard our speaker and came back telling me how wonderful he was. So I went on online and read some of his articles, and I went on to YouTube and listened to him speak. And I thought, ah, he's good. So I talked with, we talked at the committee, not uh, formally, but told about him. And everybody said yes, including our pastor who comes to our committee meetings. And he was very gracious, and he said he would be happy to come and and talk with us. So we are very fortunate that he's here. Um, we got to be sure I, I don't for, forget to say something else that I needed to say. I told him already that I wasn't going to have a lot to say simply because I wanted to give him time to talk. So I'm going to be quiet now. And Darius, it's time for you. Pray. We, what? Would you like to pray? I would like you to lead us in prayer okay. when you start, if you will, please. Okay, I will. Just come on right up here and offer our opening prayer. All right, let us pray, I guess. Yes. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for an awesome privilege to be here in this place. I pray that you bless us today, that you open our ears and our hearts as we think about the past and what it means for us today. So be with us, Lord, I ask in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be here with you and to be invited here. I feel really, really honored. So thank you for bringing me here. Um, just a couple of, couple of words about myself. You already found out in your bulletins that I'm Polish by birth, but I'm also Australian by naturalization. So I usually like to say that I speak English because I'm an Australian. I have an accent because I'm Polish. Uh, I was 21 when I immigrated to Australia. I couldn't speak a word of English at that stage. So I went to Avondale College week after my arrival in Australia and I had to learn to speak English very quickly. So I started with theology programs. So for the first year, I could not understand a word of English. But since I was 21 years old, my accent stayed with me, and this probably will not change, but that's okay. As long as you can understand me, that's that, that what matters. So today I had a great privilege to visit your beautiful city. It's, it's really, sometimes when I travel, I just go to a hotel room, I see the highway, and I see the airport, and that's it. You know, like a few years, couple of years ago, I went to Holland, and that's all I saw. You know, I saw the church, highway, airport, church, highway, airport airport home. So, <laughs> so at least today, thanks to Andreas, I was able to see beautiful place. So we went to pike markets and, and I must tell you, and variety, we went high up to under this Columbia Tower, I believe, right? It was great. What a beautiful city. It really reminds me of my beloved city, Sydney. Uh, Sydney is my hometown. I consider it hometown. That's where I worked as a pastor for a number of years. And when I looked at Seattle today, I, I told Andreas I could place Harbour Bridge right here, Opera House here, and it will look like Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody ever told you that, that Seattle looks like Sydney, Australia? It's just wonderful, beautiful. So, so it's, it's a great, it was a great pleasure to visit this place, taste wonderful food, and, and just be here uh, and spend some time with you today. We're going to uh, talk about a very a con contentious topic, as you know, as soon as you, we put the word ordination, it instantly becomes contentious. P perhaps not in this part of the world, perhaps not in your church, but uh, believe me, there is a great war going out there about this issue right here. So we're going to talk about this issue of ordination and uh, authority. Today is just an introduction. What I'm going to say tomorrow in the sermon is the second part of my presentation, which is the most important part. That's why I leave it for the sermon. This, this is just, today we're just going to, to open the matter. Tomorrow we're going to basically show what it is that we, 
what do we do with this whole problem of ordination? Uh, as it happened, when I came to Andrews University in 1993, I came to do just Masters of Divinity, I came from Australia to just upgrade my education, but I fell in love with the uh, history of theology. Basically, this is not history, okay, we, this is history of theology. So, we don't look at dates, as long as we know Luther was in 16th century, that's good enough. Uh, but, uh, uh, we study, as histo historical theologians, we study the ideas of various thinkers. And uh, when, after one year of doing Masters of Divinity, my chair of my dissertation, Dr. Raoul Dederen, some of you may have heard about him, uh, invited me to do PhD at the seminary. Uh, he said that he already was retired at this stage. He said to me, I'll let you be, I'll, I'll be your chairman as long as you do what I say. <laughs> All right, I said, like, I really wanted him to be my chairman for my dissertation. What do you want me to do? And he said, ecclesiology. And I said, what's that? Uh, this is the doctrine of the church, okay? And he took me on an amazing journey uh, into throughout the 90s, through the mid to late 90s, when I worked on my doctorate in the issue of authority, uh, in a, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, and this became my specialty. Uh, but at that stage, I got all the information I needed, but I didn't connect all the dots, okay, about, uh, about this issue of ordination authority and so on. So I started taking, in the last four or five years, as this issue became more and more contentious, I, I just suddenly started thinking about it. I was uh, working on my presentations at Andrews University, and this is the basically what I present to you is what I present to my students at the seminary. And, and I started looking at these issues, and I realized that there are incredible parallels between what we do as a church and what, what happened throughout the history of the Christianity. Okay, so I started putting those together, and the result is what you're going to see today. And I am aware that some of you had seen my presentation. It was done in 2012. I was invited to present uh, at uh, Sligo Church. I didn't know I was recorded, so this was not a recording for the sake of recording. I was just speaking to an audience like you. But there were cameras, and they put me on, and they asked me if they can put this stuff online. And some of you had seen it. So this will be a similar kind of material, a little bit expanded, because new material came in, new ideas happened, and and uh, there's some new stuff that I'm going to be talking about, especially tomorrow afternoon, uh, which is very important for us to consider. So we're going to look at the whole problem of ordination, what is ordination, and uh, we may not necessarily agree on everything, but that is, that is okay. We, we're just uh, going to look at it. You know, what I realized in my, my uh, when, when I talk to different people, what I realized that we mainly disagree on the issue of um, on the issue of presuppositions, how we approach this whole thing. I would actually prefer the light on because then I can see everybody. Okay, uh, light probably is better here. So how we approach this whole issue of, of ordination? We all come up with certain kind of glasses, you know, and we read the scripture with those glasses. And we just do that. We don't even know that we actually do that. All right? And we, because we wear glasses, we come up with different kind of um, understanding of what the scripture tells us. If I come up with specific kind of glasses, then, then the, the scripture will, will, will give me different kind of information. And the issue is not that we'll remove the glasses, because we can read the scriptures without glasses. Okay, with, I mean, for those who are short-sighted like me, or long-sighted especially, you have to have glasses. We all have to have glasses when we, when we open the scripture. The issue is that we recognize that we have the glasses. And then we study our own glasses, all right? We study the glass, and then we begin to understand what's going on. Uh, this, for example, happened in America <coughs> uh, in the 1860s, okay? You had the nation divided. There's a civil war going about the slavery issue. Both sides are appealing to scripture, okay? Both sides are reading the scripture. The, the southern states are reading the scripture, same verses, and they say, slavery is okay. They are the northerners reading the scripture, and they s say, slavery is not okay, okay? They both are wearing glasses. Uh, in a similar way, we have a discussion today. I, dis I just found this, uh, found this thing in a, on, on internet. 
uh, the problem of presuppositions. Okay, we, we all have kind of a glasses, look at the same evidence and come up with different conclusions. And, and the issue is not necessarily destroy the glasses because we have to have glasses. Uh, the issue is to recognize that we have the glasses, that we, that we actually look at the evidence. And that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about today. So how are we going to approach this whole issue I've got the, this is the problem of the presuppositions, okay? Before we even come to the issue, and tomorrow I'll address this a little bit more, what, what, what do we need to do? Uh, this is what really pains me, and I, I must say it's really sad for me, that, that there are groups of people who would get each other's throat and ready to kill each other o over this issue without actually recognizing that we're all humans and we all love God, we all want to follow God, and we need to live together and somehow, somehow worship together, e even though we may disagree on certain issues. So how, how are we going to solve this issue? Just, just, just three points, that we need to approach this topic humbly and prayerfully, and I have to do this uh, very carefully at the seminary, because sometimes I have students, less and less I suppose, who, who really feel strongly about this issue. Okay? But we all need to recognize that, that we don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers, because we live in 2000, uh, say, I mean, 2014, and Paul and the Bible, the rest of the Bible were written in first century. And we've got separation of 2,000 years, and we'll never know exactly what Paul meant when he wrote certain passages. It's just, we can't, because there's such a big, huge gap. So we need to approach the topic humbly and prayerfully. Number two, to recognize that I bring in my presuppositions. I am keenly aware that to this whole topic of uh, ordination, authority, and so on, I bring my own glasses. So, so my role is to study my glasses, okay, and, and, and look, look at what is, what is it that I actually have in my mind, what, what is the program up there in my brain that I actually have that makes me read those certain passages in, in, in a certain way. And number three, to accept that none of us have all the answers. I already said that, that we just we just don't have all the answers. When we accept those three basic, uh, three basic things, then, then we can actually start accepting each other's view. And this is, I suppose that this can be applied to many other things, many other controversial issues. Okay, and I've been, I've never heard about your church until I was approached by uh, Carol. I heard about John McClarty. I read his articles and I really appreciate what he has to say. But I know that in your church you can actually do this kind of thing. You live together with different views, sometimes you disagree, but that, that, that does not preclude your getting together and worshiping the same creator, right? And this is beautiful, this is wonderful. I'd like to see this happen across the board in, uh, in, in the entire church. So, what we're going to do, okay, what I'm going to present to you is just a part of my research. We're going to just scratch the surface. Issues are much deeper and much bigger, and uh, I'll encourage you to explore on your own. But what we're going to do, uh, this is basic table of uh, contents. Uh, today we're going to explore the problem of ordination in Christian church, the history, short history of ordination. Very brief, although it will take us an hour plus. Tomorrow we're going to look during the sermon, we're going to look at the problem of authority. And this is the bottom line of of everything, okay? This, this is the most important part. If, uh, if you're going to miss the first one and tomorrow afternoon, it's okay, but if we can think through together on this issue that I'm going to talk about during the sermon, uh, this would solve a lot of problems in our church on vari in variety of levels. And Sabbath afternoon, we'll look at the problem of male headship. This became a real issue in recent discussions uh, uh, on the issue of ordination. So, so I've got a few words to say on this. Today I'll touch on this a little bit, on the origin of this whole idea of uh, male headship. So before, uh, before I, will, I will go on, I just would like to tell you one thing, that my, all of my research is done in a uh, spirit of exploration that we were encouraged by uh, General Conference to look into ordination. And, and I suppose sometimes I may sound to kind of go against what the church does and so on, but, but I did my research in the spirit of the call uh, of the General Conference to look into ordination and finally find what it is all about. 
Okay, so that's what we, that's, that's the whole idea. But I am a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, I accept my church. This is my beloved church and I still, even though I am, I'm a third generation Adventist, my father is a pastor and even though I love my church, I think that we need to think through some issues. Perhaps there are some things that we don't do necessarily correct. And if we don't do those things correctly, then we have to rethink and start over. So I come to you with a spirit of humility and uh, let's reason together. Okay? Christian ordination is a complex issue. It's really a complex issue, has a very complex history. Uh, the way you, you see a picture here of our ordination, typical ordination in, in Adventist church, this did not come suddenly happen in in the 1850s, 1860s. They suddenly the revel they had a revelation that they're going to do it this way. I, this is not quite true. Uh, they, those people, are doing something that has been done in a Christian church for millennia. Maybe they look differently. Maybe they. Uh, they have different clothes or something, but this has been done for, uh, for many, many years. And it is universally accepted by all Christian denominations that this rite that you see here has its roots in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament. We all go to the Bible to find the answers. So, after my very careful study, okay, very careful study, the, the, which spans now almost 20 years, into, into these issues, I have come to a particular conclusion on the issue of ordination, specifically on the issue of ordination of women. Would you like to know what it is? All right, so here it is. <laughs> now that you are, I mean, some of you already know where I'm coming from on this issue. <laughs> But uh, now we'll explore the reasons why I actually believe so. Number one, ordination as we know it and practice is not in the Bible. Okay, now you should know that when I, the last slide actually is a broader statement, not just women. Okay, it's a, it's a statement that uh, I have a problem with the whole idea of ordination, whether female or male. This last statement is to catch my students unawares, you know, because some of them know where I stand and what I teach and when I present this. <gasps> All right, yeah. I <laughs> ordination as we know and practice it today is not found in the Bible. You may, you may search the Bible back to front, front to back, okay, and you will no, not find such a thing as ordination. You will not find you will not find theology of ordination. We know that the early church was a missionary movement. We know that the, those missionaries, were, those people were endowed with spiritual gifting to fulfill certain functions, but there's no such thing as ordination in the Bible. Somebody would say, especially if they use King James uh, Version, they would say in Mark 3, 14, Jesus says, uh, I mean, the author says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach, all right? It's the word ordained. But then again, if you look into Greek, you will find out that the word ordained is not there. Instead, we find the word that is uh, used, epoiesen, he is in Greek from the word poieo, which Andreas should know after taking Greek at the seminary, make, means did, made, choose, or called. Okay? So the Proper translation is, and he made 12 his apostles, not ordained, okay? So ordination as we know it, as we practice, is not found, in <coughs> not found in the text. Perhaps Jesus laid hands on his disciple, but it's not in the text. Furthermore, a second point, there are no examples of ordination rites in the Bible. Uh, there's no direct correspondence between what we do today and what happened in the New Testament, like, for example, baptism. Okay? We all know that Jesus was baptized by immersion. We, we, but disciples baptized and whole, whole household were baptized. There's a correspondence between what they did then and what we do now. We know that uh, they participated in the Lord's Supper. Okay? They broke bread together. We know that. It's documented. We break our bread together. They, they wash their feet. We do that together. There's this direct correspondence between those things and between what we do together in church. As far as ordination is concerned, we don't have it. 
It's just not there. Okay, what we know is that, uh, yeah, the, the church laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and on, on the seven, and that's all we know. We don't know exactly what it meant. Okay, what was the theology about this? What they were actually doing? They did something, we don't know what they did. They just laid hands, and that's it. Okay, that, that's basically it. So, what this laying on of hands meant, we don't really know. Number three, the, mo the modern notion of the pastor's office does not readily correspond to the position of elder leader in the New Testament. They should be in there. Okay, uh, what we do today, the fact that you have Pastor John McLarty, who is the resident pastor of your congregation, it just was not happening like this in the New Testament. It was some kind of a different, different situation. There's, there's just no readily correspondence between, between what was happening in the New Testament uh, and, and what we see today. And the next point is, there's no scriptural evidence for the threefold ordination with its hierarchical structure. Okay, the, the hierarchical structure is of deacons, elders, and pastors, we practice threefold ordination in our church. Where did it come from? You know, I have this picture here uh, to tell you, the, 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 to illustrate the hierarchy. How long does it take to ordain a deacon in a church? A prayer? All right, that's it, right? Five minutes, all done. How long does it take to, or, or does it take to ordain an elder? All right, it's a bit longer. You get a biography, a <laughs> longer prayer or something. How long does it take to ordain pastor? All right, you've been to pastor's ordination. It takes about, what, two, two hours or something, you know? It's a, a big pomp and ceremony. What does that tell you about this uh, hierarchical structures in our church? I mean, this is obvious, all right? <laughs> we make nothing out of uh, ordination of, of the deacon, okay? But pastors are, wow, okay? It's, it's a big deal to ordain pastors. And, and here we are with this, with this threefold structure that does not exist in the scripture. We don't have such a thing in, in the Bible. It's just, just not there, all right? And an authority, it just, just does not gel, okay? Number five, why I don't believe we should ordain women and men, okay? No direct scriptural evidence that local elders were actually ordained. Okay, w w what here we have is, when you look at the evidence, in Acts 13, they laid hands on missionaries. In Acts 6, they laid hands on the seven. They're not called deacons at that stage yet, they call the seven. As far as the choosing of the elders, like, like in Acts 14.23, they did it by raising out of hands. The whole community raised hands. This is the word keirotoneo, which means raising hands. All right? And we agree that those people are the best to fulfill the function of elders. We do not have evidence in the New Testament that those elders had any hands laid on them. They perhaps had, <coughs> but it's a good guess. Okay? If we really wanted to go by the scripture, we would only ordain missionaries, and the deacons. And that's it. If we really wanted to be strict. But, well, it's all right. We went a little bit further than that. Uh, and it's okay. It's not a problem to go further. What I'm just trying to highlight to you, that <coughs> what we do in our church is not necessarily wrong, but it's not in the Bible. And we argue about it. Okay? We, so this is no direct evidence in the Scripture. Okay? Number six, no evidence that only ordained pastors and elders are to lay hands upon those to be ordained. Okay, when I was ordained some decade ago, more than a decade ago, all the only ordained elders were called to the platform and only ordained elders were allowed to lay hands on the pastors. And I'm just asking myself a question, where did it come from? Where in the scripture you find that only ordained elders are supposed to lay hands on everybody else, on those who are supposed to be ordained? Clearly, in both Acts 6 and Acts 13, it can be eas as easily interpreted that, that the whole congregation actually got together. All right? Acts 6 is definitely modeled 
on, on what happened to the Levites, okay, and this whole congregation of Israel laid hands on Israel, on the Levites. And in Acts 13, it, for me, when, when you look into the text, it clearly says that they all got together and all laid hands. It was not just a specific group of people that laid hands on, on the... It's like, like accepting somebody to a special club. You know, that's... Where did it come from? Okay, we're going to explore this. The next point that I discovered is that we practice ordination that is for life. In New Testament, we could say ordination was more for a task. Like uh, in Acts 14.26, this is a very important verse here. Because this verse is the closest thing that we find in the scripture to theology of ordination. I told you there's no theology of ordination in the New Testament. This is the closest thing that we can find in the New Testament what actually laying on of hands meant. I'm using the word ordination. I shouldn't be using that word. I'll tell you in a moment why. But, but you know, I'm, I should be using laying on of hands, okay? Uh, basically what it says, this gives us a couple of interesting inf uh, pieces of information, that, that particular verse. Uh, it's a reference, this verse is a reference to Acts 13, 1 to 3, which talks about what happened to Paul and Barnabas when hands were laid upon them. The Spirit moved and said, set me apart, Paul and Barnabas, for special ministry. Okay, so this is a commentary on that particular verse, and this is what it says. And uh, from whence they had, Antioch, th they were actually, the hands were laid on them in Antioch, from whence they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they have now completed. Two pieces of information. A Greek word that is used in this case is paradidomi, which means to give over, to deliver. All right? So basically what happened to Paul and Barnabas? They were delivered to the grace of God. That's it. They were shown to have specific gifting and, and the whole congregation said, we pray for you, we give you the grace, that we believe that God graced you, we bless you. That's it. We bless you for your ministry. Go and do your work, okay? So it's a clear reference to Acts 13, 1, 2, 3. The same word, and this, gives, this is an interesting thing, you know, we practice ordination just once. Okay, it seems to me, on the basis of the reading of the scripture, that Paul was ordained or laid hands for a specific task twice. The evidence comes in 1540. This is the passage uh, just after Paul is arguing with Barnabas over John Mark, and he doesn't want to go with John Mark, and he chooses another person to go with for another missionary trip called by the name Silas. But Silas had not hands, their hands were not laid on Silas. Okay. So, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Same phrase as here. So it seems to me that Paul was reordained, or hence were laid once again on him. Another piece of information here is that it was not for life. It was for the task that they were given. Okay? They were given to go for this missionary trip, and we, we bless you for this missionary trip, and they re-bless them once again, probably with laying on offense. Okay, so this just shows you one thing. What we do today, it's a little bit different than what they've done in the New Testament. It's a different situation, okay? So, so it's a little bit different. So this is uh, another point. Point eight, and this is probably the most important point right here, that laying on of hands was used in variety of circumstances in the Old and New Testament. I uh, looked for all those instances. It's used about 26 times, I would say, in the New Testament. Interestingly, 16 of those are healing and blessing. Jesus laid hands, apostles laid hands to heal and bless uh, people. <coughs> couple of times, three or four times, we find that there were uh, laying on of hands was associated with recognition of gifts, okay? Uh, conveying the gifts, of course, the gifts were always recognized and, and the Spirit we gave the gifts, church recognizes, so it happens at least uh, four or five times, especially after baptism, that you have the gift, we'll put you into ministry, okay? And the laying hands and so on, on everybody, not just, not just the missionaries. So, so laying on of hands, give the gifts of the Holy Spirit only twice, only two instances, it's endorsement and blessing of Christian workers uh, in Acts 6 and Acts 13. 
So that should tell you something that once again we do something completely different than what was happening in New Testament. It resembles what was happening in New Testament, but it's a different thing than what we do today. Uh, what we do today does not really have um, uh, roots in the New Testament. Most of our laying on of hands today happens when? When we ordain people. Okay, we don't do laying on of hands in any other circumstances, whereas in New Testament it's other way around altogether. So it appears that the New Testament provides very little foundation for our contemporary actions as far as ordination of practices and beliefs. So it is not surprising that each denomination has different kind of ideas about ordination. And it's not surprising that that within our denomination, without seven, within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because the Bible did not give us enough information, we all tend to argue about it. Okay? So the laying on of hands is in the Bible. This is one certain thing. The laying on of hands is in the Bible, and we should practice it. Ordination is not in the Bible. So, I've got three questions. Okay? Three questions that I, I asked myself as I was doing my research. Where do we get our way of understanding and practicing ordination? Where does it come from? Okay, where is this coming from? Why is the ritual of laying on of hands today almost exclusively associated with ordination? Why do we do that? Number three, why can only ordained pastors lay hands, uh, lay hands uh, on the other pastors? So we're going to explore those, those questions very briefly. And first of all, I would like to, I just would like to say to you that in my opinion, I developed a distinction between the two concepts, ordination and laying on of hands. For us, they kind of merged. They actually merged throughout the history of the church, and we're going to explore this in a moment. But for me, on the basis of my study, those are separate. Laying on of hands and ordination are two different things. Okay, and why? We're going to look into terminology. Where does the term ordination comes from. Okay, so here's what I, this was the, the research that I'm going to present to you, uh, it was really painstaking, it took me a while to find it, I had to pour over Latin texts, uh, I don't speak Latin, I, I can read just very little bit, but it's uh, like Greek to many people, it's, uh, it's Latin, but I, I was able to look for s in ancient sources for specific words and, and I found some interesting stuff, okay. First of all, uh, we already talked about is that the very term ordination, oh, thank you so much, the very term ordination is not found in the Bible. There's not, no such word like this in the Bible. Do you know why? Because the term ordination, ordinatio in Latin, is a Latin term. And the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek. Okay, and Greek word did not have the word ordinatio. It just wasn't there. So where does it come from? Okay, it comes to us from Roman Empire. The very term comes from the Roman Empire. Uh, specifically speaking, it was uh, used in a variety of governmental structures. It essentially meant ordinatio, is the technical Latin term, incorporation into an ordo. Ordo was like a class or caste of sorts, caste whatever you want to say, but incorporation to a specific order, a specific group of people. All right? Yeah, that society was divided into different castes, so that ordinatio served as, as incorporation. It was used in two ways, in two basic ways in the ancient empire, uh, Roman Empire. It was a classical expression for naming of imperial officers. So if an emperor wanted to uh, place somebody in a position of honor, or importance, there was an induction ceremony, not associated with any layer of hands, but, but it was a basically an induction ceremony. And that induction ceremony was named Ordinatio. Okay? And for example, this is, this is what I found in Suetonius, who was a uh, Roman historian in the first century, he wrote this. Domitian, who was an emperor, ordained Matthews Rufus to be prefect of Egypt. Right? Ordained. Right? He was ordained. Actually, the word ordain is there. Okay? I found it. I was very happy when I found it. Okay. <laughs> it explained a lot. So this was the first way of using it. The second way of, um, 
using the word ordinatio occurred within the context of the governmental structure in, in the earlier period of Roman history. There were three orders in, uh, in the Roman Empire. Number one was Ordo Senatorum, Order of Senators. There was the highest order, the ruling order. Then there was Order of Equites, which was the class of knights. They were in between. And there was an order, Pleborum. Okay? This was the, the lowest order. And the authority was flowing kind of from the higher to the, to the lower. All right? So there were basic three orders. The most, uh, eventually, with time, uh, only two orders became uh, prominent in, in uh, Roman Empire. Ordo Equites kind of disappeared. There were Ordo Senatorum and Ordo Pleborum. In essence, there was Ordo and Plebs. You know, you, you know the word Plebs, right? O somebody who, people who were somebody and people who were nobody. Okay, basically, uh, that's what happened. And normally, people were born into those orders, okay? But sometimes, it was a kind of a special occasion that somebody did something special for the empire. They were actually moved into the higher level. And then, the process known as ordinatio was used, all right? So, I found another quotation from, uh, in Historia Augusta. Nor did the Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antoninus ever ordain anyone to senatorial rank whom he did not know well. All right, so uh, in order to be a senator, you had to be ordained. So I have a question, okay? This is an important question. If, if you look at this thing and, and you think about ordinatio as being part of the Roman Empire, how did it get into Christianity? What happened, okay? What really happened? How did it come into our Christian vocabulary. And he is the culprit. According to historical sources and, and what I was able to read in this gentleman's writing, uh, this is the person who introduced the word ordinatio into Christian vocabulary. His name is Tertullian. And he lived at the end of the second century, 160 to about 225. Okay? He is the first Christian thinker who is using the word ordinatio in his writing to refer to Christian ministers. Okay? Who was Tertullian? Tertullian was an apologist, Christian apologist. Uh, that does not mean that he apologized, but essentially Christian apologist, what it means was that he was defending the faith. He was a defender of Christian faith. Uh, one of many, there were several others, okay? But he's, he's one of them. He, he writes in Latin. And he, basically, what he tries to do, you know, there were lots of attacks on Christianity during that day. Uh, Christianity was persecuted. Christianity was portrayed as an idiotic religion, cannibalistic religion, atheist. They called Christians atheists because they believed one God rather than many gods. So the, the first, uh, first uh, use of atheists was applied to Christians in second century. Okay, so they were atheists. <laughs> okay, so Tertullian is trying to make Christian faith reasonable. Right? That's what we do today sometimes. Okay, when we meet with, with non Adventists, we try to make Adventism. They always think Adventism is crazy. All right, so you meet evangelicals, they kind of like. Eh. So, so, what you do, you're trying to make, build bridges, all right, with those people and trying to actually make. No, no, we Adventists believe in grace of God. You do? Yeah, we do. <laughs> okay, and so on. We build, and, and we kind of build bridges with people. That's what he was doing, okay? He was trying to convince pagans that Christianity. There's nothing wrong with Christianity. It's a good, good, uh, let the people be, all right? We, we don't kill anybody. We don't drink blood and don't do this. We just, and, and he was trying to kind of convince pagan world that Christianity is okay. So he invented many words and incorporated many theological words. We created lots of problems for Christian theology. One of them was, uh, he looked at, he looked at the society and said, all right, you have ordinatio. We do the same thing. We have induction, induction kind of uh, ceremony, and it, we just made priests, all right, or pastors at that stage. They were not quite priests yet. Okay, we kind of induct pastors into their position, all right. So, so, and he basically said, "We, you have ordo, we have ordo. Okay, we have special group of people in our church. They are called bishops. You have senators. We have bishops. Okay. So he's building those bridges." Uh, ordinatio becomes, in his vocabulary, it's an appointment to, and this is a key word, a higher office. Just like in pagan empire, they elevated people, so Tertullian says, we also elevate people. 
Okay? And he says, you have an ordinatio, we have ordinatio. Okay? So ordinatio becomes a ritual in his terminology, ritual for bishops, for induction of a bishop, priest and deacon. All right? So my question is here. Are there any problems with incorporating pagan words and customs into Christian theology? <laughs> Are there any problems with incorporating pagan words and customs into Christian theology? Well, on the one hand, we could say no. Okay. <laughs> and I've heard no here, and I had yes here. Well, no. Okay, on some in some level, it's not a problem. Okay, it, it's not an issue. Uh, we, we're doing it all the time. I mean, half of our vocabulary is pagan, you know. <laughs> Uh, I don't wear a tie because it's, it's pagan. <laughs> I will wear one tomorrow. But it is pagan, all right? <laughs> it was a, but uh, the word ecclesia, for example, it was a ec ecclesia, uh, was assembly, all right? It was an assembly, basic assembly of people. When, when Paul speaks at Areopagus, he's, he faces angry ecclesia. Ecclesia later became a designation for the church. That's why we have ecclesiology, which is doctrine of the church. Okay, ecclesiastical, ecclesiology, you've heard those terms. It related to the church, all right? Bridesmaids, okay? In, it's a perfectly good pagan custom, you know? You probably know this, that bridesmaids were selected because uh, there were evil spirits and there was a hope that they were all dressed alike, that they will kind of, the evil spirit will come at the wedding ceremony and they will just look around, which one's the bride? Who do we get? All right? They get confused and they don't get the right woman. All right. <laughs> so, so that was the, the cast. Now today, who thinks about evil spirits during a wedding ceremony, right? So, so we accept that one, one of those things is a tie. You know, if a tie was an ancient symbol of fertility. So I don't like it. On the other hand, there is a problem with incorporating words uh, because some words carry a connotation, specific connotation. And, and you cannot avoid this, all right? For example, the word bishop, okay? We in Adventist church don't use perfectly good word bishop in our church. Why don't we use it? Because it has such specific connotations. It's related to, to the order, successive order. Catholic, you know, it's a perfectly good word that was hijacked. What does Catholic mean, all right? I always believe that there are two, really, two Catholic churches in the world, there are Roman Catholic and Adventist Catholic. Church, all right? Because that simply means universal, okay? Uh, no other church has, no other two churches have structure like this, that they were connected organizationally everywhere. Catholic Church and Adventist Church, that's it, okay? So Catholic is a good word. It's been connected to the Roman, and that's why we don't use Adventist Catholic Church, all right? We don't use that word. Sacrament, okay? It's another word that was incorporated into Christian theology. So. Into Christian theology comes the word ordinatio. And ordinatio, when it comes to Christian theology, it's a loaded word. It's not a neutral word. It's a loaded word. When, when Tertullian looks at that word in a Roman society and brings it into Christianity, he knows exactly what he's doing. It's not just kind of a nilly-willy kind of action. All right, uh, he knows what he's doing. He knows he, why he's giving, putting this word into Christian vocabulary. He knows what he's doing. So, I have a, another question, okay? What happened to the Christian ministry during the second century that made the use of the term ordinatio so enticing for Tertullian? And this brings us to another area of study. Why I really have problem with ordaining women to ministry and men too. Okay? This is a fascinating story in Christianity of, of uh, Christian beliefs going awry, going a wrong, completely wrong direction following the New Testament, uh, New Testament period. Something really happened that, that Tertullian could use that word, the, the word that exactly was able to apply the same word to what was applied in pagan empire to Christian ministry. So this is a long story, lots of material there. I'm just going to go very briefly through the highlights. Okay, so what happened in the second century? Here we have a gentleman by the name Ignatius. There's debate when Ignatius uh, died, where he lived. But what we know about Ignatius is that he was a bishop of Antioch. 
Antioch is just late, and if you look on the map, a bit higher than Jerusalem. And he was the bishop, one of the or bishop in Antioch, and he was doing such a good job that Rome got the word of it, and they decided to eliminate him. You know, that's uh, he's too good. All right, too good. Let's kill him. So, so the Roman government sends a bunch of Roman soldiers to Antioch. They get this guy, and they're going to take him to Rome to kill him at the arena with animals. That's why there's a picture of a lion actually eating him up. Okay, but as they travel. He won, th- he, won, uh, he, he won the hearts of the soldiers and they were kind to him and they allowed him to write letters to the churches as they were passing through modern Turkey. That was uh, Asia Minor to on the way to Rome. They had to pass to Greece and get into Rome. So <laughs> as they're going through, through that period very slowly, he writes letters to each church. Okay, And in those letters, we have a theology of ministry like nothing that we find in the New Testament. It's a very short period from, from the life of the apostles. Okay? The church is struggling with a variety of things at this stage. The, the primary issue that happened to the church is that its leaders are dead. You know, it had leaders in the apostles, now they're they dead. Jesus was supposed to come and he never did. Okay? So they begin to argue, they begin to bicker, they begin to struggle and uh, fight and uh, Ignatius comes up with a solution to the problem of unity. You will solve the problem of unity if you concentrate the power in one person. Okay, that's his solution. Okay, I will have all the power in the church. We'll be all united if everybody listens to me. It's a brilliant solution, don't you think? It's an amazing solution, right? If you all listen to your pastor, wow. (laughs) Okay, it's a fantastic solution to the unity of the church. Everybody just does, all right, thank you. We'll listen, thank you. Okay, and that's what he does. He elevates the office of the bishop to the incredibly high level. He makes bishop the most important part, part of, of church ministry and, and, and he, he just bishop is everything, all in the name of unity. He also develops a threefold ministerial hierarchy. He is the first one to elucidate that in the church we should have bishops elders and deacons, or pastors, elders and deacons. So it's not going to the Bible, it's going back to Ignatius, okay, and his writings. So bishop, elders and, and deacons. He introduces an idea, or teaches the idea of mon episcopat. What is mon episcopat? Mon means one. Episcopat means bishop. One bishop per city. What it simply means is that Uh, In each city, Corinth, Ephesus, Antioch, and so on, there were groups of believers. They were meeting in home churches, not in regular churches. They were meeting in home churches because they were persecuted. They didn't have buildings. They were meeting in in small groups, all right? And each group had a bishop or two, okay? But for the sake of unity, Ignatius thought, we need to have just one bishop per city. So he was the first one to talk about mon episcopa. That means one bishop per city. So there was... Uh, after him it was adopted by by the late second century all churches have one bishop per city we have one bishop in Ephesus one bishop in Antioch one bishop in Smyrna all right and one bishop in Rome okay so mon episcopal is the foundation of Roman Catholicism today but that's what he that's what he introduces okay now he elevates the position of the bishop to the highest level to keep the unity He says, and this is just a couple of little short quotes, Bishop presides in the place of God. All right? When I would say to you, I don't know if it will work in this church, but it made some churches, your pastor presides in the place of God. Not a chance, right? (laughs) But but this was this what he this is what he was teaching. Eventually, this is what they adopted into the Christian theology. The pastor's word is a final word, all right? He, pres- w- he was called by God. He <laughs> well, we can't cross him. Maybe it won't happen here in America, but it does happen in other parts of the world. You don't cross your pastor, okay? Uh, so, b- bishop presides in the place of God. Obedience to bishop equals obedience to Christ, right? You're obedient to bishop, you're going to be obedient to Christ. So, he's teaching this kind of things. And, and people begin to really uh, focus on one bishop, okay? 
And he, this lays at the foundation of modern Roman Catholicism today. Uh, they still go back to Ignatian teaching on, on this obedience to the bishop. Okay, so this, is, this was very important development. High elevation of the episcopal office. Then, next development is apostolic succession. Have you heard about apostolic succession? Okay, apostolic succession is very, very important. I, I usually tell my students, that may sound interesting here within this context, <laughs> that there's only one doctrine that separates me from, as a Seventh-day Adventist, from Roman Catholicism. Just one doctrine, all right? And of course people say, yeah, one doctrine? Just one doctrine? I mean, this, this and this and this. No, just one doctrine. It's apostolic succession. You accept apostolic succession, you accept everything else. All right? What is apostolic succession? Apostolic succession is the teaching that bishops in Catholic Church are linked through ordination, right? Are linked with one another. So, so current bishop of Rome, whose name is... Francis the first, okay, was baptized by other bishops, baptized by, not baptized, uh, ordained by other bishops, ordained by other bishops, and, and it's going right back, 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 back to the first bishop of Rome, who according to Catholic theology was Peter. Peter. Okay, it's not documented, you can't find in history, but that's what they believe. Okay, apostolic succession. That, that, was, that idea was developed for the sake of the unity of the church. Okay, so, so this whole right of passing on to one another was for the, for the sake of unity, for the sake of defense of the church against, against uh, heretical teachings. The father of this theory is Irenaeus. Okay? And in one uh, of his books called Adversus Heresa, which is, means against heresies, he writes this, Wherefore it is incumbent to obey the bishops who are in the church, those who have shown possess the succession from the apostles. All right, so we'll stop here possess succession of the apostles. So if you were ordained by bishop, that means you have the truth. Okay? So, so faithfulness to the New Testament teaching was replaced by faithfulness to your bishop. All right? If you were ordained by and taught by that bishop, you must t be teaching the truth, of course. It's like a Chinese whispers, right? Type of situation here, right? One teaches teaching another, and of course, all kinds of problems came in. But apostolic succession to this day is foundation of Roman Catholic faith. Because apostolic succession gives authority, God's authority, to bishops in Roman Catholic Church today. So, why do I say this? There's only one doctrine. If I accept the authority of the Bishop of Fort Wayne, within which area uh, Andrews University resides, then I become a Catholic. And I accept everything else, unquestioningly. Okay, that's the whole idea behind apostolic succession. I, I, have, I have a couple of friends who are priests, and I met with them last week. And we talked, and, and they said, what is it that Adventists object the most to, uh, to Catholicism? Just tell me, t t t tell us this, okay? So they wanted to get it out of me. So um, uh, I could have said many things, but I said apostolic succession. And that created a big discussion, all right? <laughs> it's a found because, well, they've got a variety of opinions on that too. Okay, but basically it's a foundation of Roman Catholic doctrine. But there's something else in that passage, which in, in Catholic theology is called charisma veritatis certum, which translation is gift of certain truth, all right? That means, following on from the same passage that we've seen, uh, together with the succession of the episcopate, have received a certain gift of truth. So what is his teaching? Okay, what is he teaching? He's teaching that when you succeed, when you become a bishop, obviously I think, the, 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 through, I think that laying on of hands was used at that stage, although we have no documentation for that. Then with ordination you received a gift of truth. Okay, that simply means you can't make mistakes. All right, so, so when la hands are laid on you as a bishop, then you stop making doctrinal mistakes. You, because the Holy Spirit is with you, you'll never make mistakes. So that's what it means. You are able to distinguish truth from error. What do you think? What kind of authority ordination is getting in Christianity? Getting huge authority. Okay, huge authority, very big authority. So... Uh, then, what, because of those developments, comes Tertullian once again, okay, and he develops theology of clericalization. 
All right, you know what clericalization is? That means that the people from now on are divided into clergy and laity. Have you heard the term clergy and laity? Okay. Uh, pastors really like that to put that sticker clergy on the car, well, especially when they go to the hospital because they get a good parking spot. Okay, but uh, but but we we like the name, you know. I'm part of the clergy, you know, and and it's kind of because and there's a clear separation between those who are ordained, those who are not ordained. Where does it come from? Goes back to Tertullian. Okay, it's certainly not in the Bible. He writes this: It is the authority of the church that instituted the distinction between clergy and laity, and the honor shown the ranks of the clergy made holy for God. All right, so here we are. Uh, basically saying that, that uh, there's a distinction between clergy and laity. But the interesting thing, okay, this is the interesting thing. As he is making the distinction, which, which already Irenaeus made and Ignatius made, but he's kind of building theology of ordination right here, of what it means to be clergy, this guy is a father of what we call in, in history of theology, father of sacramental theology. He is the first one to lay foundation for the doctrine of male headship in the church. Okay? I'll speak more to the male headship in the church tomorrow afternoon. All right? But he's the first one who introduces the idea of male headship into the church. Just incipient, okay? But it grows and develops and finally is completely adopted by the 8th century that only males can be pastors, okay? W what it means, I'm going to explore tomorrow afternoon. But, uh, but here we are, okay? So it is into this kind of environment by the end of 2nd century that Tertullian introduces the word ordinatio into Christian theology. So we have a separation, we have a already ranking. Remember, in the ancient Roman Empire, we had clear hierarchical ranking. Now we have the same kind of ranking in Christianity. We've got regular people, and we've got bishops who are something else, right? something special. Right? Two groups of people, right? clergy and plebs. Clergy and laity. Laity means nothing, right? They're just people who know nothing. Okay? And clergy knows everything. Okay? And it all comes through ordination. So this is, this is a big thing. He sees that in Christianity says, look, Christianity is not that different than pagan world. You have ordination, I mean, you have castes, we have a caste, we have bishops. Okay? You have orders, we have orders. You have ordination, we have ordination. And he is the first one in history to use the word ordinatio, ever. Okay, ever. There's nothing used before his writings, so that will be the end of the second century. All right? So, that's uh, ever since then, ever since then, we've got a split in the church between higher group and lower group, between those who know something, who have a special gift, okay, and those who are supposed to listen, those who are not ordained and those who are ordained, okay, clergy and laity, and authority, of course, flows from above. The plebs, laity, is supposed to listen to whatever clergy is saying, because they have a gift, okay? They are special, they have a calling, all right, and so on. So ever since then, we have a problem. So what happened a little bit later, okay? We'll just go very quickly through, uh, through those things. We've got Cyprian. Now, Cyprian, in my opinion, is the most important church father in Catholic theology. I mean, he's... Ignatius is number one, then we've got Irenaeus, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Cyprian. Cyprian basically brings all the strengths of everybody who was teaching before and systematizes the doctrine of Christian priesthood. He basically does it in this way. It's very interesting, okay? In his writings, it's already in Tertullian a little bit, but in his writings, Christian pastor becomes a priest. All right. What does it mean? What is the function of priest? When I say the word priest, what instantly comes to mind? Priest is a mediator. Okay, priest is a mediator. And he's looking for models. And he says, all right, we have a model. We have a model of priesthood that is found in Levitical priesthood. All right. What happens when... Jesus dies on the cross. What happens to the curtain of the sanctuary? 
it, it is rent together. Okay? What he does is he took the big needle and sews it up together. Okay? And that's what happens. Christian pastors become priests. When I say priest, you said mediator. So what does it mean? It means that if you want to get to God, you have to go through priest. And the priest has to be ordained. If he's not ordained, he does not have a gift. So he, 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 in order to have a, he, be a channel between you and God, he has to be ordained. Okay, it's very important. So, Christian pastor becomes mediator, but only if properly ordained. Okay, by that stage they have ordination. And of course, by this stage, they're all teaching, he has to be male because Christ was male. If, you know, in Catholic theology, this was later developed, okay, I'm, I'm just bringing the theology uh, developments into kind of a little bit of a focus here. The priest, especially bishop, functions in the church in Latin term in persona Christi capitis, which means in the person of Christ, the head. Okay, so the bishop is, in other words, replacement of Christ. So I'm going to address this tomorrow a little bit more, okay? But if, all right, let, let, let us think here, okay? Who is the bridegroom? Who is the bride in Christian theology, in Bible? Who is the bridegroom? Jesus, right? Who is the bride? The church. All right. If we take the function of Jesus, who is the high priest, and place it upon the bishop, who is the bishop? His replacement of Christ. That means we've got replacement of Christ and we've got the bride. Are you with me? Okay. The bishop has to be male. Just like Christ was male. Okay. So they're taking this metaphor literally, applying it to priesthood. So, so you cannot, that, that's why in Catholic theology we, we're hearing all about uh, young Catholics and, and thinking Catholics would like to have women in ministry. In Catholic theology, it is absolutely, utterly impossible. It cannot be. It will be like have introducing lesbianism into the church. You can't do it. Okay? Impossible. All right? Therefore, pastor, bishop, and of course, regular priest is a representative of the bishop in every parish. He, can, he has to be male because he performs a sacrifice. All right? He mediates between Christ and, 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 and the bride. And the bride, they separated from the bride through the rite of ordination. So they're not kind of a part of the bride. They're mediating the whole thing. The pastor has to be male. It goes back to Cyprian. Okay? So this is the male hedge, the, the roots of male headship doctrine. I'm going to address it a little bit more uh, tomorrow. So ordination and ministry, we have a change. All right? We have a from function to sacrament. What does this mean? Okay? Function means that you have a gift. Go and preach, all right? You, you, you go. We bless you. You go and preach, all right? Once you finish your job, come back, tell us, what, tell us what you've done. We'll lay hands again on you, send you again because you have a gift, all right? That's a function. That's essentially function. It's just everybody has a different gift. All right, sacrament means you're special. Something happens to your soul when you are ordained. There was one development that I don't have on screen. During the ordination, Augustine taught you receive a special sign on your soul that is unchangeable. You just receive the stamp, you're ordained for life. Okay? Forever, for life. And that actually came into Catholic theology a bit later. So sacrament simply means pastors become channels of God's grace. All right? And they have to be ordained. All right? What happens next? Okay, in later centuries. We have development of something that's called universal or absolute ordination. Okay? What, what this means? It was developed in a, about 4th century. Up until then, uh, in, it was just you were ordained to a task. Okay? What, what you do, you lay your hands and they will send you. But because of what Cyprian did and Tertullian, they had to kind of think, okay, if, if this is like changes, you re changes, reconfigures your soul, then it has to be for life. All right, so, so uh, basically they introduce something called universal absolute ordination, which means the hands are laid upon someone without his being asked to fulfill a particular task or minister to a particular community. Essentially, what this means is it was practiced universally on only after the Council of Chalcedon. Ordination becomes attached to a person rather than task. 
in the Bible, they lay hands on Paul and Barnabas. Here's a task that we want you to do. Go and do it. Okay? They come back. We've done it. Task is finished. Here, ordination is forever attached to a person. Okay? So, th this is another thing that we as Adventists practice, don't we? Once ordained, almost ordained. And I mean, some, in Adventism, you can lose your ordination. In Catholic Church, you can't. That's why you can, you can be the worst possible priest, but you can't really be defrocked. Once ordained, always ordained in Catholic Church. So that's why a priest can still function as a priest in prison. All right? He can still do his, his job. In Adventism, you can lose it, of course, because we have a different theology. But in practice, ordination is attached to a pastor for life. Okay? I, I think that is perhaps not quite right, but that's what we do. All right? So what else happens here? Okay? Uh, Hippolytus of Rome in uh, 215, this is the first mention ever, first mention ever in Christian history of any sort of ordination. <coughs> He's the first one uh, to write, it, this is kind of a, nobody knows for sure whether he wrote apostolic tradition, it's attributed to him, but in that book, and I, and I read it with great interest when I discovered this, that book, already at the beginning of the 3rd century, assumes a threefold ministerial distinction, that of a bishop, pastor, elder, uh, and deacon, bishop, elder, deacon. That means that they already throughout the empire, every church had this kind of structure. Uh, number two, each receives a separate ordination. Okay, pastors are separated, elders are separated from pastors or bishops, all right? It's a different kind of ordination. So we've got three ordinations right there. And thirdly, for the first time we find out in Christian history that only bishops are allowed to ordain other bishops. Okay, so this is the first time in, uh, first time in history that we see that only bishops are allowed to ordain other bishops. So you have to be a bishop, you have to be ordained person to ordain other people. Otherwise, you can't do it. So this goes to the third century. And, and we practice this as Adventists, don't we? Okay, we, we follow in the same kind of a mode. So my question is, where does ordination come from? Okay, it's not coming from the Bible. It's coming from Christian tradition. Okay, so in the conclusion to early developments, we see a movement from functional, service and preaching oriented to sacramental, essential for salvation, expressing rank, status and ruling kind of oriented. All right, so we have a, we have, we have a change of ministry, as a cha complete change of what was in New Testament, as we're going to discuss it tomorrow, what we find in New Testament, to, to what we see here. Okay? The, the church by the 3rd, 4th century was a different church than what we find in the Bible. It was structured authoritatively. If, you wanted to, if somebody wanted to go to God, they had to go to the priest. All right? Big priest function as this barrier between people and God. You want to go to God, you have to, you have to go through priest. Salvation is mediated through the priest. Uh, and to, to, that, to that extent that in Catholic Church, when you go to the Mass, this is where sacrifice happens. Have you heard of the term Eucharistic sacrifice? What it simply means that properly ordained priest makes the change from regular bread and wine into a real body of Christ. And when people eat that, they receive salvation. Okay? It's salvific to eat bread, real body of Christ. All right? But it can only happen if the priest is properly ordained. If he's not ordained, not going to happen. That's why our Lord's Supper is not considered a, a rite that works. Okay? If, if you want something that works, that brings salvation, you have to go to Catholic Church. All right? So that's basically what it, what it means. This is what it means sacramental here, okay? And bishops receive a humongous amount of authority already then. They are standing in place of God. So those are the basic early developments. And of course, what happens to the believers, okay? The believers have to submit, all right? There are two castes, two different people. We've got clergy and laity. Clergy has all the authority in the church. Believers submit. Okay, so this is this goes back right to this early church. All right, so it's no surprising to me that Jerome, uh, the one associated with Vulgate, 
a Latin translation of the Bible, in 4th century, he says this, there cannot be a Christian community without its ministers. Okay, are you with me? There cannot be Christian community without its ministers. Now, let me ask you a question. Would the Adventist church survive without ministers? Without or pastors, clergy. Would the Adventist church survive without clergy? Yes. So what are we talking about women ordination? What's the Why are we talking about this? Are you with me? Okay. In Catholic Church, if you have no ordained clergy, the church does not exist. It just does not it, it's finished. You have to have bishops who give authority to priests in order for the church to exist. You take all the bishops out of the picture, the church doesn't exist. It cannot exist because mediation is gone. Okay? So ordination is very important in the Catholic Church, incredibly important. This, this all was recognized by the Protestant Reformation. Okay? They, what they did, the Protestant Reformers, what they did is just remove this priestly caste from the picture and they said, we all have direct to God, and they called it priesthood of all believers. Okay, that's the foundational teaching, priesthood of all believers. That's a, one of the slogans for the Reformation. We all can direct access to God. But how did the Reformers actually practice their Reformation? All right, Germany is divided in different cantons, so different, different uh, provinces. And if the prince becomes a Protestant, everybody else becomes a Protestant. Whether they know Protestant teachings or not, suddenly the church changes from pro Catholic to Protestant. Okay? So what happens then when people are not properly taught and so on? Uh, you know, Reformation tried to change things, Luther and Calvin and others, but in reality they just carried on with the old tradition. They just did not change that much at all. all right? Nothing really changed during the Reformation. So elevated status and prestige of ministry was never fully repudiated by the Protestants. And then Protestantism splinters and elements of the early developments remain in many denominations. So okay, Protestant of 16th century, then we've got Wesley and others coming in and, and this kind of division between pri priesthood and laity, uh, pastors and laity kind of stays. It's never repudiated. It stays in Christianity. Uh, and it's still with us today. So what about Adventism? Okay, I'm just jumping, big jumps here from Reformation to Adventism. How did we begin? Okay, this is the first phase of our existence. This is 1844 or 1840s, where Adventist leaders and Adventist people, when they believed that, they b you know, remember that they believed that Jesus would come in 1844, and they uh, are ridiculed and laughed at, they kicked out of, their denominations. As a result, they developed a real dislike for organized religion. Okay? They didn't like creeds, they didn't like organization, they didn't like ordination, they didn't like anything. All right? We're just people of God. Of course, they believe Jesus is going to come very soon. And for them, this is, this is the uh, big idea here. We don't have to organize, we don't have to do anything. So the first, first phase of, of uh, post-grade disappointment is we don't need organization. But in the 50s, they're realizing something. They're preaching the gospel. The shut, shut door message is already out of the way. They're preaching the gospel, and they're having all kinds of trouble. False ministers, property issues, trouble here. Trouble. They decided, all right, we don't write organization, but we need to organize somehow. Who owns the publishing houses? And so they begin to think about organization, especially James White and Ellen White. They spearheaded the movement. In the 50s, they fight. They've got a huge fight because some Adventists say, no organization, they kicked us out. The other Adventists say, organization, we have to organize, all right? They have a fight, lots of people leave Adventist church, but by 1863, they finally organize, okay? So the second phase is Organization is necessary to fulfill the mission of the church. We need to really fulfill that mission of the church. And they have ministry, okay? They, they say, all right, we see what's happening in other churches. James White and Joseph Bates were already ordained in Christian connection before they became Millerites. And they're thinking, all right, 
all right, we, we better lay hands on people, right? Better lay hands on people and let's, let's just uh, make sure that when we send our ministers, they are the legitimate Adventist ministers. So they develop this purely functional role. It's nothing special, okay? This is the guy who goes on a horseback to preach from church to church and he is sent by the leaders, all right? That's what it is, okay? My, my question is, has this changed? Has this changed? Okay, it's a very important question. Has this changed? Have we changed in our Adventist thinking? Have we, as we developed our organization, have we changed from functional to sacramental? And my question is, I think so. Because if we didn't make the change from functional to sacramental, we would never fight about women's ordination today. It would be non-issue. I always tell my students that Ordination of women is a Catholic problem, not Adventist problem. Should have never been an Adventist problem. Okay? It does not belong in Adventism, this whole issue, all right? So, so have we changed? I, I think that we have. We ascribe to ministry more than, than we did in the past. This is what Ellen White wrote. At a later date, the right of ordination by the laying on of hands was greatly abused, as I described to you. Unwarrantable importance was attached to the act, as if a power came at once upon those who received such ordination, which immediately qualified them for any and all ministerial work. All right? She's talking about Catholic Church right here, but doesn't it happen in Adventism? I think that we fight about women's, ordina women's ordination today because we attach unwarrantable importance to the act of ordination. If we didn't, we would not fight. Isn't it obvious? If we didn't, we would not fight about this, but we have big committees and everything trying to decide what it is this that we do. We don't know what we do anyway. We do attach unwarrantable importance, maybe not in America, but we... Uh, we do in America too, in some places, uh, but but certainly outside of America, it's it's really tragic. Okay, so let me let me just conclude. Okay, conclude this whole session here with ordination and attitude towards women. Okay, this is an interesting part of what I what I discovered. Edict of Milan was a big change for Christianity. A huge change for Christianity. There was one thing going on in Christian church already, which was the sacramentalism, clergy laity, ordinatio, and so on. But Edict of Milan makes Christianity a legitimate religion. Reli Christianity from illegitimate religion becomes legitimate religion. All right? So this is basically free Christian altogether. So Christians, Christians are coming out of underground, out of home churches, into the public sphere. And what's happening in the public sphere? In a public sphere, women are nothing. Women are absolutely nothing. Okay? They can't hold property. They can't do anything. Okay? So when Christianity is in the public, we have to behave like the rest of the empire does. So th this is a, r a little diagram of what happened. Okay? Growing institutionalization and the ministry of women. All right? As the church is institutionalizing from the Christ, from the time of Christ, we have New Testament community. Okay, and it's growing institutionally until the 16th century reformation and on. One person becomes more and more important and that person is male. Women are completely removed from any form of ministry throughout this period right here. Male headship begins to dominate Christianity everywhere. Okay, and let me just show you a few examples here. Okay, <coughs> this is what Tertullian says. And do you not know what, that you are each and if the sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age? The guilt must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that forbidden tree. You are the first desert of the divine law. You are she who persuaded him who the devil was not valiant enough to attack. You destroyed so easily God's image man. On account of your desert, that is death, even the Son of God had to die. And do you think about adorning yourself over and above your tunics of skins? Tertullian. Clement. Every woman should be filled with shame by the thought that she is a woman. The consciousness of the, for their own nature must evoke feelings of shame. Council of Laodicea, this is a very interesting council, in 364. Women may not go to altar. 
presbytites or women elders, as they are called, or female presidents, are not to be appointed in the church. So in 364, before then, we still have women elders, and they are told no more. And interestingly, this is the same council that forbids worshipping on Sabbath. So they kill women and Sabbath in one go. Okay, Afrafat, 4th century. From the beginning it was through woman that the adversary had access unto males, for she is the weapon of Satan. For because of her the curse of the law was established. What? This is going to the still... John Chrysostom. What else is a woman but a foe to friendship, an inescapable punishment, a necessary evil, a natural temptation, and desirable calam calamity, a domestic danger? Therefore, if it be seen to divorce her when she ought to be kept, it is indeed a necessary torture. For either we commit adultery by divorcing her, or we must endure daily strife. <laughs> The whole of her body is nothing less than phlegm, blood, bile, rheum, and the fluid of digested food. If you consider what is stored up behind those lovely eyes, the angle of the nose, the mouth, and the cheeks, you will agree that the well-proportioned body is only a white and sepulchre. Uh, Basil of Caesarea, we're just warming up. <laughs> Basil of Caesarea. <laughs> however hard, however fierce a husband may be, the wife ought to bear with him. He strikes you, but he's your husband. He's brutal and cross, but he's, member, he's, he's hands for one of your members and the most precious of all. Okay, Augustine. One could also posit that the reason for her creation as a helper had to do with the companionship she could provide for men, if perhaps he got bored with his solitude. Yet for company and conversation, how much more agreeable it is for two male friends to dwell together than for a man and a woman, nor could I have been, not could have been for the purpose of companionship. I cannot think of any reason for a woman being made as man's helper if we dismiss the reason of procreation. Pope Gelasius I, nevertheless, we have heard to our annoyance that divine affairs have come to such low a state that women who inc are encouraged to officiate at the sacred altars and to take part in all matters imputed to the offices of the male sex to which they do not belong. Synod of Paris. In some provinces it happens, this is 9th century, that women press around the altar, touch the holy vessels, hand the cleric the priestly vestments, indeed even dispense the body and blood of the Lord to the people. This is shameful and must not take place. No doubt such customs have arisen because of the carelessness and negligence of the bishops. You see how male headship is coming into the whole thing? The image of God, papal decretum, 12th century, is in men. In such a way, there is only one Lord, the origin of all others, having the power of God as God's vicar. For everything is in God's image, and thus woman is not made in God's image. All right? Then we've got Bonaventure. The male sex is required for the ordination, for no one is capable of receiving ordination who does not bear the image of God, because in this ordinance a human being in a certain way becomes somewhat divine, while he is made a participant in divine power. But it is the male who is by reason of his sex imago Dei, the image of God, just as it is said in the 11th chapter of the first letter of the Corinthians. Therefore, in no way can woman be ordained. That's 13th century. Now, Thomas Aquinas, because there is a higher water content in women, they are more easily seduced by sexual pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to drink more water. <laughs> All, right. All right. 15th century training manual for witch hunters. Why superstition is chiefly found in females? Females are more carnal than males, especially since she was formed from a bent rib. <laughs> Females are intellectually like children. When woman thinks alone, she thinks evil. All witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which in, is in females insatiable. Cherubina of Sina, Rules of Marriage, 15th century. When you see your wife make an offense, scold her sharply, bully and terrify her. And if that still doesn't work, take up a stick and beat her soundly, for it is better to punish the body and correct the soul. Readily beat her, not in rage, but out of charity. <laughs> and then finally, whew, we have Reformation. 
Okay, Reformation. Luther, women are created for no other purpose than to serve men and be their helpers. If women grow weary or even die while bearing children, that doesn't harm anything. Let them bear children to death. They are created for that. It is commonly the nature of women to be timid and to be afraid of everything. This is why they busy themselves so much about witchcraft and superstition. One teaches the other so that it's impossible to tell what kind of hocus pocus they practice. A little bit more of Luther. Men have broad shoulders and narrow hips and accordingly they possess intelligence. <laughs> Women have narrow shoulders and broad hips. Women ought to stay at home. The way they were created indicates this. For they have broad hips and a wide fundament to sit upon, keep house and bear and raise children. All right. John Knox, for who can deny but is repugnant to nature that the blind shall be appointed to lead and conduct such as do see, that the weak, the sick and impotent person shall nourish and keep the whole and strong, and finally that the foolish, mad and frantic shall govern the discreet and give counsel to such as be sober of mind, and such be all women compared to men. Calvin, it is the law of nature that woman, women should, woman should serve her husband and give him honor and reverence, Women, by ordinary law of nature, are born to obey. For all wise men have always rejected government by women as an unnatural monstrosity. Women are prohibited from fulfilling their ministerial functions and their service for the church is strictly limited for the poor. Well, we're coming to US. 1868, 14 amendment defines citizen as a male. Women's petition for voting rights is denied. Black men are allowed to vote. And look at the date 1920. Women are granted a right to vote in the general election. Is there anybody here who was born before 1920? Okay, you know, this is not that long ago. This is not that long ago. 1920, my grandfather just died, he was born in 1912. Okay. That was not that long ago. And then we have this. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, not to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. You know, Adventist movement was a revolutionary movement. It was a movement when it began they had an ideal of preaching the gospel all around the world. And everybody was called to do so. All people were called to preach the gospel. Okay? We all were gifted. We, our, the person who was called to have prophetic ministry in our church was a woman. A woman. Okay? A weak woman at that. Everybody had a gift. And then something changed. As we became more and more institutional, okay, less and less, the women played less and less role. We're going to explore this tomorrow, the afternoon, the reasons for all of this, okay? But isn't it time that we return to the original ideals of the New Testament and early Adventist church? And, and we stop fighting about ordination, just, just do something with it or put it under the carpet or something and, and, and just let's, let us all be ministers. Okay, so on the basis of what, of what I presented, this is the last slide here, that Christian ordination, okay, in contrast to biblical setting apart, the lay, apart the laying on of hands, is number one, appears to be unsupported by biblical evidence. It's not there. It's associated with such ideas as power, male dominance, submission, unhealthy view of authority, appears to stand in opposition to the New Testament principle of the priesthood of all believers and has roots in pagan and Roman Catholic tradition. And that is why I have come to a conclusion a while back and it's my ideal. I am very uncomfortable with the whole idea of ordination. Very uncomfortable with that. Because of, of those reasons. So I, I'm kind of an advocate that we, we shouldn't ordain anyone. 
We should lay hands on people, of course, okay, and, and set people apart. But ordain, that's a problem. I, it's a problem. Maybe we should even get rid of the word ordination, but, but I don't think it's going to happen. We, we're going to keep it no matter what. But if we got rid of the word, it will be part of the problem, you know, and redo our theology. I will try to do that tomorrow during the sermon. Uh, redo our theology of what ministry is. You see, we, we have this theology of ordination committee, TOSC. I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand. Now we need to talk about TASC, which is theology of authority study committee. We need to realize what authority is, and I'm going to speak to authority tomorrow during, during the sermon. So what I just wanted to show, these are the reasons why I don't think women should be ordained to ministry. But that applies to everyone too, of course. Okay. I, I think we should rethink that at least. We should, we should start thinking as a church and, and reject what's unbiblical, keep what's <coughs> biblical, and stop talking about women's ordination because it's, it's a Catholic problem. It's not an Adventist problem. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you.